I'm going to talk as uh, my dear friend talked about. I'm going to talk. The title of my speech is Pondering Upon the Riddles of Continuity. I'm trying to speculate, trying to think over what is the meaning of continuity and how we are going to reconstruct continuity and if there is any relation or any connection between continuity and the concept of identity. But before starting my speech, I would like to give you a quote by Gabriel Garcia Marquez in his beautifully written work called 100 Years of Solitude. In that book, in that literature, he says, if one day a person travels in a first-class compartment of a train and literature in the cargo, then we should realize that the world is over. I'll be coming back to this quote later on. One of the most challenging questions before us is the issue of continuity. How should we understand the position we are now in? What is the relation between the past, the present, and the future? Do we have any meaningful answer for these questions? Should we oppose what are now and instead wholeheartedly embrace the golden age? Which age or epoch is golden for us? Is nativism the answer? Is modernism the path forward? Is romanticism of the primordial past the correct strategy for reorganizing our social fabric? How should we understand the dialectic of continuity versus discontinuity? Are all these questions anything to do with the grand problematic of identity. I have four general axioms to offer here. The first one, we are all stuck in the past. The past is haunting us as a mad dog. The past is important but not as a sacred moment. The past should be imagined as a recreation point of reference and not as a fetish, i.e. an object of irrational reverence or obsessive devotion. Could we talk about the cult of fetishism in the contemporary world? One of the leading assumptions of modernity is the concept of enlightenment. What is the enlightenment? Immanuel Kant defines it as, quote, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without guidance from another. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in the lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. This is how Immanuel Kant defines enlightenment. If we would follow the Kantian conception of the modern reality, then we should believe that humanity is on the top of its growth and maturity today. But the reality seems to be different than what Kant has depicted for us 200 years ago. Why? Because the era may be considered as an enlightened age, but the state of world cultures 
and societies and people who live as individuals across various parts of the world haven't emerged from their self-imposed immaturity yet. We are indeed in the age of fetishism. By that I refer to blind adherence to ideologies and isms which coerce us to forget the common human ground and instead force us to revere or hold in the highest regard idols or narratives that demonize the other. In other words, what Kant considers as enlightenment is an adjective of the epoch, but this epochal attribution automatically doesn't elevate each one of us to an enlightened position of maturity and growth. To become mature, we need to think about the fundamental questions of human life and existence. But in a world where literature, art, humanities, poetry, dance, music, philosophy, painting, and creativity are luxuries of the few, then how could we claim enlightenment? Then what would be a human identity without humane features of life? In a sense, we can see infatuation with the past is a global phenomenon. The rise of right and extreme parties in EU and US are examples of these global trends. And in our part of the world, attraction to romantic nationalism in different shapes and moods are undeniable examples of various forms of irrational infatuations with the past, and hence the construction of distorted forms of identities. I can refer to two categories of race and religion as forms of demarcations across cultures and societies today, as far as identity narratives are concerned. Of course, the demonstrations of politics of identity in Europe or America and Asia or Africa are not similar in their contents. For instance, in our part of the world, when we meet the other, religion or denomination is important tool for demarcating in terms of identity. But in Europe and US, race is the tool for demarcating between us and them in the making of narratives of politics of identity. I don't know if uh, I'm sure most of you maybe have been in Europe or in America, but I remember the first time I wanted to apply for a job in England. They gave me a form, application form. I was written, okay, write your name, and then we're asking about, are you white? What kind of white are you? Are you Irish white? Are you British white? Are you Asian white? Are you Slavic white? Are you Middle Eastern white? I was wondering what the hell is going on. We were asking, okay, am I white? I was thinking I'm white, but they were saying, no, you're not white. I said, what am I then? They said, you are fair. I said, what's the, what's the difference? You are a little bit pale. I said, oh, okay, I'm pale. I'm not white. But then I'm asking, what the hell? Why should we categorize each other? But the, another example was, I remember first time, when I went to Sweden, I was about 15, 16 years old. I was working in a shop. There was a girl who came, I think she was from Kurdish origin in northern of Iraq, but spent few few years in, in Iran. And then she came, I think, with her family to Sweden. So she could speak a little bit Persian. So I started to talk to her and asking about, what's your name? She was a very pretty girl. Asking, what's your name? Where are you coming from? She said this. I said, the first thing came to my mind was, uh, are you Shia or are you Sunni? And she was older than me. She looked at me and said, no, I'm Shunni. I said, what? And I was thinking in my mind that I'm very well read. I have studied and I know all these like denominations among Muslims. I knew, okay, Shias, they are Ismaili, Isna'ashari, and then Zaidi. 
And then the Sunnis are, for example, Maliki, Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, who are Sunnis? Then I said, I really don't know who are Sunnis. Could you tell me who are Sunnis? She said, yeah, my mother is Shia, my father is Sunni, so I'm Sunni. I said, ah, then I realized I shouldn't ask all these questions. Because why? I was actually inculcated, I learned to demarcate with the others through religion and denominations. Then I thought these things are bad things, so I have to put them aside. But then when I went to England, I realized, okay, there, religion is not very important. But what is very important is race. So people try to reconstruct their social fabric through different categories. Maybe in the East or in the Muslim world, maybe religion and denomination is still is very important. And then we might think, okay, they're very advanced, they're very developed. They don't think about religion, denomination, although within parentheses, if you go to the uh, to Northern Ireland, if you're Catholic or you are, for example, you're Protestant, that's very important. It could actually uh, put you into danger if you, if you say wrong words. So I was thinking maybe, yeah, they are very well advanced, but then realize, oh my God, religion is for us a very, like a very big thing, but for them still skin is very, I mean, the color of skin. So I'm sure maybe most of you have experienced that as well. However, focusing on these categories has hindered us from seeing others as human persons. Thus, we base and strengthen our biases by reference to a history of the past, i.e. a golden age, a golden race, a golden history. But all these divert us from seeing the present reality, now and here. How should we see the present reality? This is a question we should ask ourselves. I guess we can look at it through various angles. One could be the angle of a slave, i.e. someone who is not intellectually mature enough to feel and think of life independent of traditions isms or ideologies of the past or present. And the second angle could be the perspective of a mature human person who is described by Rumi as follows. First I read the Persian and then I translate it into English. Rahro behel afsane ta mahramo bigane از نور علم نشره بی شرح تو دریابد هر کوسوی شمس الدین از صدق نهد گامی گر پاش فرو ماند از عشق دو پر یابد But don't be satisfied with stories how things have gone with others Unfold your own myth Make your own story Use your own mind, your own intellect without complicated explanation. So everyone will understand the passage. We have opened you. Start walking toward Shams. Your legs will get heavy and tired. Then comes a moment that love will give you wings to fly. Now if we go back to the beginning of our presentation, which started by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who said, if one day a person travels in a first class cabin of a train and literature in the cargo, then we should realize that the world is over. What did he mean by that? All human literatures, art, philosophy, poetry, paintings, novels, music, songs, epics, and even friendships are products of love, or what Greek philosophers termed as philos. Any human sojourn deprived of these dimensions would be reduced to a mechanical machine without the ability to love or philos. And any society, any society deprived of constant search and research for philos 
would not be a good society, and any identity, individual, communal, or social, disconnected from philo, sophie, in its truest sense of the terms, i.e. philos, friend of or lover of, sophia, wisdom, would lead to disaster, despair, misery, genocide, and even ecocide. But why is that so? Why is that so? Sayyid Imaduddin Nasimi explains this in a very eloquent fashion. Man das sigar ichi zahan, man bud zahan asig mazam, gohari lao makan manam, koun makan asig mazam. Two worlds fit in me, but I don't fit in this world. I am the essence without place. I don't fit in the entire universe. I don't fit in the entire universe. If we are going to reconstruct our individual as well as collective identity, this permanent dimension of human existence shouldn't be suppressed or sidelined. Our ideals and ideas and all our aspirations should have an existential connection to this profound dimension of human existence, which all great philosophers, Gnostics, and sages in all cultures and civilizations pondered upon. The concept of identity without consciousness about this dimension would lead us all to dystopia rather than utopia. Thank you very much. <laughs>